In 43 AD, the Romans invaded Britain with their shining armour and their Mediterranean suntans and their imperial army, but they were deeply resented by the Iron Age Brits, and it was centuries before the country was well and truly Romanized. At least, that's the story we know and love. But here, in an idyllic part of Somerset, is a site that tells a very different story. The local archaeological society have uncovered a villa built within decades of the Roman invasion. What's more, it seems to have been occupied by Brits. So were the locals as hostile as we think? What was going on here? Can we sort out the strange story of Blacklands? We've only got a limited amount of time, just three days. Just years after their arrival, the Romans had constructed Bath in the southwest, a major Roman centre of grand stone buildings. The defeated Brits, meanwhile, were living in wooden roundhouses and sticking with their tribal culture. Or were they? The Blackland site, ten miles from Bath, has been partially excavated and geophysed by the Bath and Camerton Archaeological Society. They believe they have an Iron Age site with a very early Roman villa built on it, including a substantial gatehouse. So they've called us in to untangle this complex site. Guys, this is a fool's errand. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> it is. Look, the geophys has all already been done. Yeah. The trenches have been put in. The villa's been excavated. Job done, let's go yeah. home. But all the questions about the site haven't been answered. There's still a lot more to do. I mean, on the villa site, for example, we, we don't know the exact dating of this. We don't know the phasing of it. And we don't know that there isn't an earlier timber structure underneath. So there's a lot more to do on that to start with. And this gatehouse has got loads still to tell us. Look at those amazing linear features coming out of there. They don't go anywhere. What's going on there? I'm far more interested in all this tantalising geophysics down here. Now, the first thing I think we ought to do is resurvey that, because John has got state-of-the-art equipment. We should be able to get much clearer results down here. And to test all that, you see, so far they've only been able to put in one trench to actually find out about this mm. earlier Iron Age material. So much more potential. Uh, so what are we going to do first? We're going to clean up and open up an area in the northeast part of that uh, villa area there and we're going to redo the geophysics here and then move on south. While geophys gets underway, Matt sets off the local team on the partially excavated villa, hoping to find out just how early it is. The British summer doesn't hold for long. As the heavens open, Mick's enjoying a dry moment of collaboration with the local society. Look into that weather out there, Jay, and I'm really glad that we're in here. <laughs> what do you think we can help you with in the time that we're here? Well, I think the big question really is is the date of the, the, the Poto Villa, or whatever we want to call it, farmstead. Um, you know, when we first came here several years ago, we looked at this, this building yeah. uh, and we assumed it was a late Roman villa. Which most of them in Somerset are, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and we began to realise that we were dealing with something very different um, and started getting these very early dates from the finds. And you've done fantastic geophysics on the site, although I think we can probably help with the, yeah. the new kit that we've got. A lot of that looks like Iron Age yes. stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and presumably that's mm. of great interest yes. to you if you're yeah. thinking the things early. Yeah. We, we, we assume that we've got a very long phase occupation here, right from through the Iron Age into the Rome period. And it's that intersection between the Rome period and the Iron Age that is of great interest to us. So that's mm. something that we really want to look at. The society believe the villa looks like this, and early finds suggest it dates to the first century AD. 
They also believe that the villa complex was built by Britons already living at Blacklands at the time of conquest. Britons who were quick to adopt Roman ways. But are they right? Can this site point us to the day the Romans arrived? We're facing some soggy work down a hole that may hide key evidence to understanding the site. Bridge? Is that a well? It is. Why are we digging a well? I mean, a hole's just a hole, isn't it? Well, it is, but this is quite a significant one because this is meant to be dated to the very, very early Roman period, about the first century AD, and it's significantly over top of a late Iron Age ditch. And of course, at the bottom of a well, you get lots of finds, and we just want to see what those finds are and get some more dating evidence, that kind of thing. Kerry, you're our health and safety bloke. How are we going to dig that without killing ourselves? Well, what we're going to do, we're going to put a machine slot in front of the well, get down as far as we can safely, and then we're going to board it and shore it so we can work from the outside of the well and we'll half section it as we go. As we prepare for the next storm, Matt gets stuck into the villa trench. I guess this probably came from the villa, do you reckon? I would have thought so, yeah. It seems like the explanation that we've got a demolition dump in the top of the villa, so it's yeah. interesting to see what date that, that is. Our own GFIS results are also giving us plenty to get our teeth into. So is your survey better than theirs, John? Well, they're both really good. Right. Oh. So they I didn't mean, do too bad then? Not at all. I mean, we've managed to add some detail and sharpen things up. Right. But the main ditches, look, the big curving ditch there, we've got the same right. features showing. So does this affect what, what we do, do you think, in terms of excavation? I think it does here. I mean, this, this ditch that's running down, it's beginning to look now as if it carries on here, or, or possibly it might be part of this yeah. square enclosure. Yeah. So this is obviously a lot more complicated around here. See, Moyo is, is drawn still to this area here where they had the, the Iron Age material. And now that John has resurveyed it and really sharpened it up, you can see clearly this circle, which does look like an Iron Age roundhouse. My instinct would be to say, let's open up maybe an area, go for the southeast area, because we're more likely to get an entrance there, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's about 15 metres in diameter. Wow. That that's is a big, that's that's a a big, big one, isn't it, yeah. really? Yeah. So Phil opens his trench over what appears to be a roundhouse. His mission, to approach the moment the Romans arrived from the Iron Age side. Bridge, having left the local diggers to go down her well, opens a trench where there seems to be an undated rubbish pit, suggesting an occupation site. Helen opens her trench where the geophys results show a mysterious crossing of ditches that may hold finds. Within minutes, a new find emerges. Stone tile. It's got that reddish kind of purpley look, isn't it? It's got point to it. Yeah, I think it's worth... Uh, that could be a roof tile. ..worth asking, because if it is a roof tile, isn't that the first one? Yeah. When the Romans arrived, southwest Britain was divided up into tribes such as the Deboni. While there were Brits who were hostile to Roman imperial expansion, others, particularly those who were already trading with Rome, were more welcoming and more likely to build a Romanised building. You've got this Iron Age landscape and suddenly plonked into the middle of it, you get this super modern villa. How did they know what to build? Where did they get the ideas and the craftsmen from? Well, you've got a lot of things happening very close to here. Go 10 miles to the north and you've got the Roman town of Bath. Now, this is somewhere where a huge investment is taking place in the 60s and 70s. There are probably masons coming across from Gaul, probably Roman engineers, building this massive monumental temple and everything that goes with it. And I think what John says is correct, but I think you've also got to accept that there are people here in the late Iron Age who are probably already important, already perhaps high status. And what they're doing, and that's before the conquest, and after the conquest, what they do is develop a Roman villa, perhaps um, referring to sites in southeastern England, to show off their um, allegiance to the new authority, perhaps, and their links to the southeast of England and their knowledge of building structures. So, what would the people around here have felt who couldn't afford this 
lovely, swanky new Roman villa? I think intimidated to start with. I, it's like thinking about medieval cathedrals, sort of peasant going and suddenly seeing this huge mm. spiring tower. Uh, this is, they'd be in awe of it. And that's what they feel when they go to see Bath. OK, a small little villa like this is not quite the same, but it's very alien architecture. Yeah, I mean, most people in the region at the time are still living in roundhouses, so somebody who builds a villa like this is showing off their links to the new political authority. Or it could be seen as huge faux pas, like someone putting up stone cladding on their building. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with that. <laughs> As well as villas, the Romans introduced another alien feature to our landscape. Yes, the Romans brought the garden to Britain. Gardens were standard parts of villa life. So we're going to create our very own Hortus under the watchful eye of Hilary and Monica and we're keeping a close eye on authenticity. Do we actually know what plants and flowers the Romans used? We've got a pretty good idea because various plant remains have been found, particularly in a herb shop in Colchester, and they've been analysed, so we know they had things like dill and chervil and various other things, so we're going to try and select plants which, which fit in with that evidence. Why don't we ever dig up anything like that? What have you got your eyes on today? We're going to go for this urn here. It's a nice simple shape and we've got the acanthus leaves at the base, which would be just right for our garden. I'll tell you what, we could stick this on top of Bridget's well. I don't think she'd be very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Back on site, we're getting dating evidence for the occupation of the villa. You found our villa yet, Matt? Oh, I just pulled a bit of it out here, actually, a bit of box flue tile. So I think we found it, but it wasn't here. I think what we have here is the demolition from it, um, and it's sitting in this ditch here. And I've just got to the top of it, and we're already getting loads of pottery out of here. So what kind of dates? It's kind of early, early second century, second century stuff. So does that mean it was demolished in the early second yeah, century? Yeah, if, if this demolition came from there, the top layer of it here is second century pottery mixed up with the demolition. So Matt's finding walls that were torn down in the second century. So, Tom, does that mean that the villa itself could have been built in the first century? Yeah, I think it could be late first century AD. In which case, that would be what we're looking for, wouldn't it? That would make it really, really early, much yeah. earlier than anything that's ever been found around here. Yeah, exceptional. The only other site we have nearby is one in Gloucestershire, which dates to that period, so it's an exceptional structure in the area. All this means we know that there were people here in the Roman period by the second century but we don't know for sure there were people here when the Romans first arrived or that they built the villa then. But we've got great evidence from the Iron Age in Phil's Marquee. Here, Phil, you getting married? Married? I thought you'd put this up for your reception. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you, you're invited to the party. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that looks nice. That is an exceptional find. I am really, really pleased with that. What we've got is, is a... Well, it is a complete red deer antler. The deer has not shed it, it's, it's died, because that is actually part of the skull of the deer. So the head is down this end, and we'd have had the, the, all the points at that end. But you see, what, is, what they've done to it, look here, look how they've chopped through the back of the antler, mm -hmm. and they've snapped that off. But they've also removed that tine, that tine, and if you see there, there's more cut marks in there where they've removed those tines. So what does a find like that tell us about the lives of the Iron Age people who lived here? Absolutely loads, Tony. First of all, it tells us something about their diet. They may not have been eating venison all the day, but you can bet your life on it, because the head was attached to it, probably the rest of it was they were eating venison. But also it tells you that it's so much raw material for so many other associated trades. It's, it's raw material for the handle maker, for the knives and for the foils and for the chisels. So it just gives you so much more information about their lives just by having one red deer antler. By the end of the day, we're beginning to understand more about everyday life here in the Iron Age. But we haven't got closer to the very moment the lives of Iron Age Britons were turned upside down by the Romans. 
This morning, you were so up about this idea of digging a villa that's already been dug. Yeah. But after a whole day, I can't see that we've advanced our understanding of this site one jot. Yeah, but we have. I mean, just to take the villa itself, We've now got second century pottery and second century demolition material in the top of the ditch, which rather suggests the house went out of use and they moved and went somewhere else. That's useful. Otherwise, we've done what we do on a normal site, not just because it's anybody else's site. We've looked at the geophysics and we've targeted a number of things on the geophysics and we're beginning to get results. Where Phil's digging, we've got Iron Age material. You know, we've, we've probably got an Iron Age roundhouse or something like that there. The other holes here are producing Roman material, but we're only in the, top of the tops of the features. We need to give the archaeologists time to get down into those to give us the full story. What about this geophys? Well, if you look at the geophys, the thing that stands out is it's very, very noisy all across here. And then at that line there, it stops. Just because that's the end of the field and that's as far as they that's went? That's as far as they went. There's no reason to believe that it doesn't go on through that gate down there and straight down that field. Finds and something really exciting tomorrow. You sure? Absolutely certain. You really sure? Yeah, yeah. Beginning of day two here in Somerset, where we're looking at the time when the Romans first arrived. And under that green tent, we think we've got a Roman villa. Under the white tent is a possible Iron Age roundhouse. The whole field seems to be dotted with finds. So what's Mick doing? He's gazing out at the next field. <laughs> what are you bothering with all that for? Well, we're doing some geophysics across that field there, because the geophysics in this field, all the signals stop at this boundary. Uh, and, and it's unlikely to be true, that. I mean, this boundary is probably, I don't know, 18th century, something like that. So I think it goes off into this field. What do you think might be here? Well, this way may be the equivalent of the village where the peasants live. So we'll do a strip of geophysics along here and see, see what we get in here. So what kind of clues might you be looking for in the geophys here? I think I would hope to see lots and lots of small roundhouses, smaller than that one, perhaps, not within their own enclosures, perhaps an enclosure around the whole lot. You know, rather more like ordinary peasant houses. And we'll pop a trench and have a look if we get signals like that. On the villa site, Matt's been having trouble finding a definite date for the villa's construction. Demolition rubble's been dated to the second century, so it's definitely a very early villa. But it could have been built as much as 50 years after the Romans arrived. So were there people living here at the time of conquest? We're adding to the pottery finds that paint an unexpected picture. So what sort of date range of Roman material have we got here, Mark? Well, we've just got a small selection here, and we're really starting with the, the later part of the first century AD right. and the second century AD, but we've also got some late Romans, some fourth century AD, but it's predominantly late first and second century, but we've got a bit of a gap with the earliest Roman pottery. We have not yet been able to recognise any pottery that dates from the period of the Roman conquest through to about AD 75 or thereabouts. So that's about 30 years missing yeah. at the beginning of the Roman that's period. Right, right, that's right. Yeah, that's right. what I would say. Does, does that indicate that there are gaps in the sort of buildings and occupation on the site then? Well, it, I, it's looking increasingly to me from the pottery that we ought to have another building somewhere. Right. Well, <laughs> that's a bit of a conundrum, isn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> I mean, you're presumably not thinking of a villa-type structure at all, are you? No, I wouldn't expect a villa at that date. You're probably thinking about a timber building, a farmstead. It could right. conceivably still be a roundhouse at this phase and just making the transition to a more right. rectilinear Romanised timber building. Right. Well, we'd better have a look at the geophysics I and everything so. else, haven't I we? Think and see so. what, see yeah. what, where that might be. Yeah. If we find a missing building, it may reveal Romanisation, no longer wooden and round, but rectangular or stone-built. Then in Helen's Trench, we find hints of just such a structure. Helen put a trench in here because she thought there might be a big ditch here, and sure enough, you can see that against the clay there, but it's this side of the trench that you've started getting really excited about. Yeah, look, we seem to have found a wall. It's got these great big stones in it, and the finds that are coming off are interesting. We've got a piece of samium ware. 
and a lovely rim of black burnished ware. Good Roman stuff, but then we've also got a piece of clay pigeon, so we're really not sure what the date might be yet. I mean, the thing is, we didn't know it was here because we'd only done a magnetic survey. We got the ditched enclosure, but we didn't see this wall. I mean, if this is a building, then it puts a whole different perspective on it. Where is the ditched enclosure? Well, you say ditched enclosure, but hang on. Well, I'm standing on the corner. It's 30 metres long that way, it's 10 metres long that way. Could it actually be a huge, great big timber building, this enclosure? And if that's possible, could that stone wall be the replacement in stone? So we could maybe have a sequence. How do we find out? Well, we're just about ready to extend the trench and we're going to go exactly that way, where you are. So I think you better move. But the West Country weather is proving a challenge. In past excavations, the local society have uncovered what seems to be a major gatehouse designed for the villa. The two supporting towers had massive footings, and they're bothering Stuart. I mean, what's really unusual about that gatehouse is the scale. I mm. mean, that's a substantial building, that scale at six metres by three metres for each tower. Something of that order you'd expect either on a fort or a big villa. It, mm. it seems totally out of context in relationship to that very small building, doesn't it's, it? It seems half the size of the actual villa, which mm. it must dwarf yeah. it, really, in respect. That would make it really unique and unusual. I, I, it, it puzzles me why it have something so big with that. I think it just needs a little bit more work to see if we can get to the bottom of what this structure really is. But at least we've already solved one mystery. Yesterday in this trench we planned a major excavation. It looked like there was going to be a 20 or 30 foot deep well in here, didn't it? There. It and, did. and, and you were going to shore it up around the outside. I was. Going to half section it. I was. Make sure that none of us were hurt because you're our health and safety man. I was, yes. Look what we've ended up with. Yep. It's pathetic. It is pathetic. And what's happened is they've taken out their backfill from the last time they excavated here and it bottomed out to about three inches three inches. I can't tell you how excited he was about this. How long have you been planning it? Uh, for weeks and I've had generators, scaffolding, uh, acros, everything in for this. And this is what we've ended up with? It is. But my primary concern is my tent, which is in that hedge over there. What are you, what, what are you on in terms of light? Yesterday, Phil's trench gave us a worked Iron Age antler. He's now convinced he's digging within an Iron Age roundhouse. But could his Iron Age site be much bigger and run into our second field below? What's the news then? Have we got our village? I could not have been more wrong about this, Tony, what I said this morning. <laughs> I, I, I had this vision in my mind that this would be full of roundhouses and it's absolutely fantastic, but it's nothing like what I predicted at all. Uh, what have we got <laughs> instead? I mean, we've got a massive ditch continuing round. I mean, it circles round for 40 metres. It seems to be a really large yeah. enclosure. So that means that before the Romans came, there was this huge, Ooh. presumably one building well, with that, this enclosure inside? I think that's what we don't know, because I mean, you know, we assume this is Iron Age going with this, but actually we don't know that, do we? We, we need to look no, at it. No, we, we've got to dig this, really. Yeah. But what we really need to do is get some dating evidence from this field, and we think, go for this entrance. It's very exciting, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Matt opens a trench in the second field inside a ditched enclosure. If it is Iron Age, it would have been built to enclose the Iron Aged roundhouse in Phil's tent. Phil! Phil! Hurry! I've got Mark for you. Wow. Where he comes up trumps. Come on then, let's see this. I'm all of a quiver, I really am. I know what I what? found, but I don't know what the detail is. You. I've never found anything like this before. Oh, my before. word, it's an Iron Age coin. I know, that's what, but give me detail. Right, well, it certainly belongs to the group that we call Dubonic or Southwestern British. You've got a lovely head there with a, you see the nose, yeah. chin, eyes and hair. And there should be a horse on the other there side. There is, there is. <laughs> and there's the horse with the triple tail. 
So this is before the Romans have arrived? Yeah, almost up to a century before the Romans arrived. I didn't realise they were making coins then. Yes. Coinage appears in Britain towards the very beginning of the first century BC or the end of the second century BC and reaches this area by about 60, 70 BC. What would that horse signify? Well, the horse is a very common symbol on Iron Age coins. Uh, it may be a symbol of luck and also perhaps power and authority. So, Phil, what does this coin tell us about what was happening in your trench? <sighs> I mean, presumably it's, it's a high status object. Well, these things don't turn up on every Iron I, Age I mean, site. I mean, I've like... just never found anything like that before. I've seen pictures of them. But we've got to also place in our mind that, that, that we do have this big roundhouse, this 15-metre yeah. diameter yeah. roundhouse. Now, that is a high-status building. That's and, and I yes. think, you know, the high-status building is going to go with a man of power. It's the sort of guy who would have that coin. Yeah, I just, quite oh. possibly. So you're mildly pleased to have found this? I am this. just <laughs> over the moon. I'm literally all of a quiver. <laughs> I just can't believe it. <laughs> the most well fun done. that Phil could have without a stone tool in his hands. The first Iron Age coin ever excavated on Time Team. And it begins a flood of finds from all over the site. <laughs> I don't think we've had window glass. No, no Jane think, said we hadn't no. found any on the site before. Yeah, what a lovely colour. The technique of making it is to blow a great big bubble and then snip it down the middle and open it out flat. It is a beautiful thing. We've gone down into another layer, yeah. a lower layer, yeah. in the pit here, and we're coming up with these really lovely fine weirs. And I just would like your opinion on their date. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with the same one, because it's always the easiest. That's South Gaulish from Southern France. Yeah. And I think that's from a sort of shallow plate or platter known as a Form 18. But it's a type that probably dates, I don't know, you're probably looking at the last 30 years of the first century AD, which is interesting. Oh, great. Bridges finds are just some 40 years from the time of conquest. But we still lack evidence of occupation from the actual transition point from the Iron Age to the Roman period. Lovely. There's the... Let's keep it on the trail, actually, until we can get it in the tray. Oh, lovely. Now, what are you looking for? I'm just, first of all, just looking at the profile. It's the first chance to get it. It is a classic sort of mid-first century AD cordon jar profile. I think this is probably going to belong to somewhere towards the middle of the first century AD. It is, in fact, right on that transition. Say that date again. The middle of the first century AD. Middle of the first century? Yeah. So, so, in other just words... Just either side of the conquest I was going to say, that's sort of 50 AD, yeah. which is about the time of the conquest. Right. At last, we've got firm evidence of people living somewhere around here at the time of the Roman conquest. A pot imported from the Roman Empire for wealthy Britons. Of course, it doesn't give us the exact location of the conquest period building, but it's a big step. With a glimpse of our goal, work hots up, and we've got some unexpected visitors. Um, if you just yep. head down that, straight down. OK. So you back to it and then just come down. It's a punk rock invasion from the men in black, the Stranglers. We're um, rehearsing with the band and we knew you were here. And I'm a fan, so I want it to come and see. <laughs> Bit <laughs> Halfway through day two and the whole site's becoming frenzied. Even the gardeners in our Roman Hortus are on a roll. Well, this has come on well. We put a lot of hard work into this today. So all different things in all the different beds, yeah? Yeah, we've got four different beds. We've got the bed here on the right-hand side, which is the medicinal bed. On the left-hand side, we've got a herb bed. Over here, we've got a veg patch with lots of different things coming along there. And this bed is the decorative and sacred bed, in a way, sacred plant bed. And a very foxy statue. Yes, we've, we've got Venus here. 
And Venus was actually the goddess of the horses or the garden, so she's in charge of all this lot. And it's actually the most commonly found statue in Roman gardens is of Venus. She's got her, her dolphin alongside, which refers to her marine birth. Um, Keeping her virtuous uh, at the moment. Absolutely, very important that the tail is in the right position. And in fact, in this the bed here, we've got two plants which are actually sacred to her. We've got the rose bush here and we've got myrtle here um, and often brides still have these flowers in their bouquets. Back in the tent and fills a quiver again. We've got another coin but I think it might be Iron Age again too. Have a look at that. Uh, oh excellent, two coins from the same trench. Is it, it is Iron Age. That's isn't it? definitely Iron Age and I can tell you that it's it's definitely Debunic. See what you can make out. Look, you can see the horse. Oh, that's yeah. On that side there. Yeah. See what's on the other side. Ah, you've got this wheat sheaf type arrangement. So, a... so this one hasn't got a head on it, like no, the other one. No, it doesn't one. have a head on it. But it's a classic, the Bunnick coinage. And I think you can just make out there on the top some inscription. And it looks to me like that's the name Anted. Are you sure? Yeah. Can you see it? <laughs> I can't <laughs> see that. Yes, there. Ed yeah. on the end there, and that's the and name that's, of a, a that's the name of a Dubonic ruler, minting coinage, probably in the late first century BC, very early first century AD. And we really do not have any Dubonic coinages from a pre-conquest context. So if this is Iron Age, it really is very rare. Everything from this trench, with the exception of a few stray bits of Roman pottery, everything from this trench has been Iron Age. The first Iron Age coin on time team and now the first Dubonic coin ever found in context in Britain. And it shows we've got really wealthy Britons living here in the Iron Age, a type who could have been quickly Romanised. We've also got finds giving us the scent of a conquest period building, but there's still a fly in the ointment. All day the archaeologists have been obsessing about the villa and the Iron Age roundhouse, but Stuart, you've got to be in your bonnet about something else, haven't you? Well, the gatehouse, yeah, I just don't understand it at all. What's your problem? Well, it's the scale of it seems inordinately large for what is really not much more than a farmstead rather than a big villa. Its axis doesn't actually look onto the villa at all. If the two were associated, you'd expect it to be square on so you could see the villa as you came through it. Yeah. It just seems wrong. Roman towers and gateways tend to have the larger projection from where the gate is on the inside of an enclosure and here that's this direction. This is the inside and this is the outside and looking at the plan that implies that the inside of whatever this gateway leads to is this side and not this side where the villa is. So it's not a gateway going into the villa at all? It's going into something else. Well, that, that, that's a $64,000 question. Is there another villa in here? No, <laughs> not in that enclosure. Well, hang on a minute. I mean, it's possible there's something on this side to which this gateway relates. Can you expand on your no, John? It's just, we've done more detailed work now. There's the gateway. There's this avenue that Stuart's talking about. And the responses inside just don't go with a villa building. I can't tell you what they are. So, I mean, the only way to solve the problem is to put another trench in, I'm afraid, just selecting some of these anomalies here. But if Stuart's right and the gateway is pointing in that direction but there's not a villa there, what could there be there? Well, villa enclosures aren't the only kind which will have a monumental entranceway. Occasionally you might find something like a Romano Celtic temple or a, a ritual site of some sort will have a massive monumental uh, entranceway. John, it's nearly the end of day two. Everyone's really soggy. It's pouring with rain again. Are we going to start now? Um, why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'll mark it out. Somebody else can do it. And true to his word... According to Stuart, you could be in the middle of a temple. Stuart? Yeah, I well, think it's a load of rubbish. But well, I do as well. <laughs> Mind you, if it is a temple, it's based on the geophysics. geophysics so, okay, it's, yeah. you know. While Kerry's left out in the cold, <laughs> the rest of us find several excuses to keep dry. Good day, eh? Fantastic, particularly the coins from Phil's trench. You like your coins? Oh, just absolutely stunning. Well, come on, show him. No, oh, what? Do we have to? <laughs> Look, I just happen to have it here, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> What's so great about this? What I think it's showing us is the people in that roundhouse are living there in the centuries immediately before the Roman conquest. This is 
what, 10, 20 AD, something like that? Yeah, and back into the first century yeah. BC. The main thing is that is pre-Roman. Yes. Yeah, but it's pre-Roman, and what we're looking for is that magic moment round about 43 yeah. AD when the Romans arrived. But you see, in Bridget's trench, the further she goes down that trench, the earlier the pottery gets, and she's back to about 70 AD now. So we've got Phil coming one way, going forward, Bridget going backwards, you know, Sooner or later, we've got to meet at the conquest in 43 AD, haven't we? Are we going to meet in the middle? I hope so, tomorrow, if we keep going. And lots more finds? I'll dream to that, yeah. Take a look at this. This is not only the rarest coin we've ever found on Time Team, it's unique in British archaeology. I'm crowing a bit, aren't I? You yeah. are. <laughs> <laughs> The Roman invasion of 43 AD was one of the most important moments in British history. Imagine the transformation in trade and transport and culture that it must have meant for the people who lived here. And we're now honing in on those very years when the Romans first arrived here in Somerset. Yesterday, we had a cornucopia of finds coming out of the ground. By the end of the day, Stuart was also convinced that there was a Roman villa or temple on the other side of the Roman gatehouse. Please don't tell me you've got a villa or a temple. Oh, I'd like to say yes, just to see your face, but no, I haven't. <laughs> what it is, is we've got a simple drainage ditch. Someone's cut through one layer of stone, to, yeah, gone down onto this layer, so you've got a nice smooth bottom ditch and the water just runs away off the hill. So this is all bedrock? This is all bedrock, just different layers of bedrock. No finds? No finds whatsoever. So my intention is just to clean this up and then record it. And there's nothing else in the trench? Nothing at all. I'll have to break the news to Stuart. Yeah. Can I come with you? Yeah. <laughs> Not only is Stuart for once wrong, but we're still driving to understand how Blacklands became Romanised. We've had some great finds from around the conquest, but still no building to go with them. But then Mark stands back to look at the bigger picture. Mark, it amazes me that Mick can ask you to go off and look at all these manky bits of pot which look virtually identical. Yeah. Uh, and you can make a coherent story out of them. <laughs> what do they tell you about the people who lived on this site? Well, this stuff, Tony, is really focusing on this transition we've been looking for from the end of the Iron Age and into the yeah. early Roman period. Yeah. And in fact, we can sort of relay this stuff out. These pieces here, which you can see are noticeably cruder, if you like, are actually late Iron Age. Right. And then we've got this range of material. It's more Romanized, but following on from some known late Iron Age forms, but they're now making it in a clay or fabric that's Romanized, basically. It's yeah. much finer. It, you're going in for mass production. Overall, we're looking at a range here that would take us from about 50 BC down to about 80 AD. And the stuff that comes from around the time of the transition between the Iron Age and the Romans, is that from the villa site? Oddly enough, there is none of it from around the villa site. It's all coming from down the slope, mm. from an area between where Phil and Bridget have been digging. Nothing that early from our villa. So does that imply, Mick, that this was the area of activity? when the Romans arrived? I think it does, if that's where it's all coming from. Well, we've seen the Iron Age stuff out of Phil's stretch, haven't we? Yes. So it looks as if it's actually nowhere near the villa, but much yeah. further down the slope. Yeah. But we haven't got any walls or houses, have we? Well, no, but on the geophys there are some sort of circles, you see here, which we haven't excavated, which could be round houses of that period. Of course, the other possibility is there are timber frame structures in there which aren't showing up on the geophysics but at least we know that they are actually in that area rather than anywhere else. Yeah, That's the pottery tells us that very, very clearly. Yeah, yeah. So the story's shifted, hasn't it, from when it we has. arrived? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So we've worked out that the villa wasn't the earliest Romanised building on the site after all. There should be a different building from just after the Romans arrived, and it should be somewhere down here. While Phil and Bridge dig for the time of the conquest, our Roman garden is blooming. You're finished. We've finished. It's fantastic. I think uh, I'm really pleased with what we've done here. I tell you, after working in all those muddy trenches for two and a half days, it's just great to sit here in the sun. It is absolute bliss and everything's all done. Wonderful. Do you think the Romans would have done something similar to us right now? Absolutely they would have done. 
gardens are for re relaxation, aren't they? They like outdoor rooms that we talk about nowadays. So you bring your work out here, women would bring out their spinning, they'd bring the children to come to play, they'd pick the herbs. How do we know all that? Well, we find things like children, broken children's toys, we find spindle whirls in the ground um, on sites, and that's very good evidence. And of course, we've got the goddess of love. We have, and I'm sure assignations were made in Roman gardens, just as they would be nowadays. If we'd had time to put a water feature in, we could have had a pool here. What we could have done after dinner, Tony, is we could have actually floated love letters to each other across the water feature. We know that they used to do that. Get your spade out, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the second field, Matt's at the bottom of what we think is the entrance to a huge enclosure located by Geophys. So how are you getting on with this ditch then, Matt? <laughs> well, I think I've just about got to the moment of it now, finally. It's a little deeper than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's enormous, isn't it? Yeah, and at the bottom, it's kind of claggy clay deposit with bits of charcoal, and, and I found one bit of pot out of it. Uh, I just want to have, ah. you to have a look at it. Oh, that looks good. Well... That's definitely late Iron Age. That's excellent. So that confirms that the ditch was dug in the late Iron Age then and backfilled in the Roman period. Yeah. Was excellent. Because all that was Roman down to about there. Yep, yeah, but right. the initial digging is, is late Iron Age. Brilliant. Yeah. Let's get the rest of it out and see if we can find you some more. Great. So Matt's ditch is a massive Iron Age enclosure around Phil's and Bridges Trench. The pottery has shown that the living area at the time of conquest is also within this enclosure. From the geophys and huge curve of her trench, Bridge suspects her rubbish pit may cover another roundhouse, and she's found a fixture. And what's that thing there? Well, this is really neat. This looks like it's a pivot stone from a door. So you'd have had the frame coming out of here and the door pivoting back and forth like that. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. There we go. Yeah, all right. That's very nice. Got that triangular shape there. And look, you can see the groove mark in the side there, where the, where the um, pivot of the door frame would have come up there. You can see where it's been wearing away. So it's quite a sophisticated building. What might it have been? Mm. Well, potentially we have a stone-built roundhouse, possibly built after the Roman conquest by people using Roman pottery. So if we've got a Romanised roundhouse, that's a completely different part of the story, isn't it? It is, but we knew we, could, we were lacking a building at that period because we've got the pottery, we haven't got a structure to go with it. Mm. Looks as if Bridge might have found it, and the reason we haven't found it before is it's been demolished. So is it that when the Romans arrived here, the high-status locals didn't just go, oh, well, we better move into a classic mm. Roman house. Mm. They just used some Roman technology and incorporated it into their own roundhouses and only built a Romanised house later. Yeah, they continue sometimes to live yeah. into roundhouses until they build the villa, perhaps. Bridget, this could be the missing link. <laughs> it could be, but I'm going to go down and find that for you. With just a few hours to go, Helen's rectangular feature has given way to another structure entirely, one of stone and so Romanised. This is looking a lot better, isn't it, Helen? It looks like a proper excavation here. <laughs> it certainly does. It's looking absolutely gorgeous. But we've still got a few problems. Like? Well, everybody agrees that this is an Iron Age roundhouse. What, th this sort of area in the middle? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the, with these stones coming round in an arc. Yeah. And it's got eaves strip gully thing and all the things that you'd expect from an Iron Age roundhouse. Yeah. Except it's only got one solitary single piece of Iron Age pottery. Right. So um, <laughs> there is a possibility that it could actually be a Roman roundhouse. So we've got Matt digging a trench across the wall to try to find out and Tom is working away at a post hole which could also be associated to try to find something that's yeah. earlier. So what about this wall then? Well, the wall is a real enigma because it did seem to turn at that end, we're yeah. pretty certain, and then peter out. Right. But then at this end, it just kind of gets a bit lumpy and, and stops. It just seems to be a wall in the middle of nowhere. And that's really odd. It, it, it doesn't relate to a building as far as we can see at all then, does it? No, absolutely not. Right. As she runs out of time, Helen's Roman walls remain a mystery. She thinks she's got a Romanised roundhouse, but the date remains elusive. Bridge, though, has found an even more impressive building. Hi, Bridge. What's going... <laughs> what on earth is that? Are you impressed? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it looks as though we've got massive foundations. God, it does, doesn't it? I mean, that's clearly been carefully laid. 
Yeah, and look, we've got a construction cut yeah, running around that side. That. And it's curving up in that direction through yeah. there. So, then we've got good levels on all of these. Yeah, and this pit's cut through the top of it. Yeah, and actually what's really nice about it is you can see where they've actually put the pit in. They've been digging away, digging away, digging away, and then gone bang against these and realised, oh, blow that. Why move them out the yeah. way and just went over the top? <laughs> yes, it looks like a massive footing. Yeah. Have you had any material from around it or within it? All of this here in front of you oh, is from right. around the, this foundation. Well, let's, let's have a look. You've got some decorated samian. Well, that looks to me as if that ought to date to about 60 to 80 AD. That's good. That's earlier than what we were having Yeah, before. it is. And, I mean, looking at this, this, this looks like good sort of late Iron Age bead rim, but it's also appearing with the sort of earliest Romanized forms as well. So we're definitely looking, I think, at that period of about 60 to 80. So this really is filling the gap in time that we've had for structures and occupation on the it site. It is indeed. Uh, can you imagine how, what the size of this building must have been like? It's <laughs> truly astonishing and you know, unusual in any context in Roman Britain, I'd say, to see foundations on this scale in the countryside this early. In the last minutes of the day, Bridge has revealed what we've been looking for. A stone roundhouse, a Romanised building constructed by Brits within a few decades of the Romans' arrival. Over the last three days, you've got more and more excited about this site, haven't you? Yeah, I have, yeah. I think it's been a fantastic site. Why? It, well, it's, it's that junction between prehistory and the Roman period, and, you know, we're right on it here. I think we're right on it, more or less, where we're standing, actually. In the three days, we found the site where Romanisation first took hold at Blacklands. We've uncovered three roundhouses, and while Helen's remains undated, the heart of the story is in Phil's high-status Iron Age one and Bridges' massive stone one from those critical years after the Romans arrived. And our finds paint a picture of the people at Blacklands who adopted Roman ways so quickly. Pottery, revealing trade with the continent, rare coins, belonging to the powerful and wealthy. Pretty good few days. Absolutely. This site promised so much and it delivered even more. Not only did we extend the Roman life of this place by about 200 years, not only did we get right into the heart of an Iron Age roundhouse, but we got very close to the people who were living here at that extraordinary moment in time when the Romans arrived here in Somerset. Oh, and one other thing. I think we've probably given the local archaeologists a few more years' work to do, don't you? Probably about 30 years, I think, yeah.